It's a great pleasure to have um, Olivier Bodenreider with us. Um, he has been um, a good friend and um, we've done a lot of work together, particularly the students have done a lot of work together with him and received uh, his mentorship. So that has been a huge value for us. I remember Kartik Ramakrishnan was one of the early ones that uh, did your yeah. internship. Yeah. Um, Dalroy did it, uh, of course Veen has done it, Satya, uh, Satya yeah. Sahu did it, Kalpa. Uh, wow, okay, yes, Kalpa yeah, yeah. did it, and, and Mary M. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all those guys, right? Uh, most of them are gone, but uh, Veen is the one that is left here. I know a couple of you want to talk to him about the possibility this year. Last year we were too late to connect him with the summer internship, but anyway. They did internships with him, they followed up the work. You, if you go to library and type Olivier, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of papers uh, that are co-authored with him. Um, uh, you, you all read the biography, but very quickly, he's a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, uh, and chief of the Cognitive Science branch at um, NLM. NLM is extremely important for all of us who work on health data, all of us who are interested in NLP and that kind of stuff. And uh, he's really the key point person on anything that relates to knowledge representation and ontologies and so on and so forth, which is what we're going to hear about today. So thank you very much, Oliver, for coming here. And it's a delight, and we look forward to this talk. Thank you for your kind introduction, Amit. I'm delighted to be here this morning. As, as you were saying, uh, we go together uh, a very long time, and uh, it's always been a pleasure working with students and, and with the group here. Uh, so, I'm a researcher at the National Library of Medicine in uh, at the Lister Hill National Center for Biomedical Communications, which is one of the research and development centers for the library. And my research is on ontologies and terminologies in the biomedical domain. And this particular piece uh, that would we're going to talk about today is uh, about quality assurance. How to do, how to do quality assurance uh, for these uh, sometimes very large biomedical ontologies, and we're going to talk about SNOMED CT this morning. Uh, so, last time I gave when I prepared this presentation, uh, there was this slide on the presentation, and uh, I left it. Last time I gave this, this presentation, a version of it was actually in Beijing this summer. Uh, where I was visiting another uh, former postdoc, and uh, and I had the great fortune of uh, you know doing a little bit of sightseeing, including the Great Wall, and um, so that that was that was a great experience. Uh, this is a mandatory disclaimer that I have to show, saying that it's not your government talking or the U.S. government talking; it's essentially me as a researcher. So. Uh, so the talk today is going to be uh, loosely based on the paper that we presented, uh, that we published earlier this year with a bunch of other people, uh, Lee Sang Sui, uh, who is in uh, GQ Jiang's uh, lab, or works closely with uh, GQ. Uh, he's he was. Uh, at Case Western, he is now at the University of uh, Kentucky Lexington, and we've again we've been working together for a long time, and uh, that was another product of uh, this long time collaboration. Um, so I'm going to talk about SNOMED CT a little bit for those of you who are not working closely in the biomedical domain, and uh, and then we're going to talk more about quality assurance. By the way, if you have any questions at any point in time, you don't have to wait until the end. And, uh, I'm, I'm going to set aside some time for questions, but uh, if you have any burning questions, feel free to, to interrupt. <coughs> so SNOMED CT is the largest uh, clinical terminology in the world. It contains uh, over 300,000 concepts, uh, a million terms for these concepts with their call descriptions. An interesting thing about SNOMED CT is that, is that it is one of these new kinds of terminologies that's built using description logics. So uh, you're all familiar with all and these kind of things. 
So they use an EL++, they don't use OWL2, they use an EL++ profile, actually of uh, description logics. That's more adapted to the kind of uh, presentation that they want to have, uh, and that uh, works faster in terms of classification also, uh, because it's less expressive, it's sufficient for what they want to do. Uh, so, we're gonna talk about quality assurance of hierarchical relations, and of course, in a description logic system, the hierarchical relations are just the byproduct of the logical definitions. And uh, I want you to keep this in mind because, and I'm going to go back to that uh, towards the end. Uh, so this is pretty much the top level of uh, the, the Stomach CT ontology or terminology. I will use the, the two terms pretty much interchangeably in this context here. As you may expect, you find pretty much everything that needs to be uh, here to represent biomedical concepts. You need, uh, you need uh, anatomy, you need drugs, you need procedures, you need diagnoses, and all these things are interrelated uh, through the logical definitions that um, SNOMED CT provides for these concepts. Uh, here's a particular example. Uh, we have appendectomy, and appendectomy is described as a kind of procedure uh, whose direct site is the appendix, and the method is excision. So what it's telling you is an appendectomy is actually the excision of the appendix. It's, uh, it's a way of formalizing this knowledge. Bear in mind here also that the knowledge that you, the kind of knowledge that you can find in SNOMED CT and in most biomedical terminology is not encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, it's essentially definitional knowledge. So SNOMED doesn't tell you that appendectomy uh, usually comes in the form, or manifests itself in the form of abdominal pain and maybe some fever and these kind of things. That's not the purpose here. The purpose is just to tell you what, uh, what appendectomy is, that it is a kind of a procedure, that it involves the appendix, and these kind of things. And it is useful not, for, not as a knowledge base, of course, but it's useful uh, to do a precise description of uh, diagnoses, for example, in, uh, in electronic medical records. And it's useful also when you want to aggregate because by virtue of having specified that the appendectomy uh, has procedure side the appendix, you can find, you can do query and find all the procedures that uh, have appendix or any of the descendants, uh, of any of its descendants as their procedure side. So it's useful for analytics purposes as well. And of course, if you want to do this right, uh, the, 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 the description, the, the, the logical definitions need to be right. And uh, of course, the, the hierarchical relations that are the byproduct of these definitions uh, through description logics uh, need to be right also because otherwise the aggregation is not going to bring everything that you expect it to bring. And your analytics uh, will go astray. So this is a representation of appendectomy. That's the concept at the bottom. At the bottom, and it's the complete path to the root of appendectomy to the root of snowman, and it should simply shows you uh, the uh, richness, if you wish, of these hierarchical relations in in snowman. What this tells you also is that there's no way a human can curate this. Look at it, it sounds right to me, and uh, next, 300,000 to go. Uh, I mean, that if we want to do quality assurance of hierarchical relations in such a large and complex terminology, we need to have automated methods. So, no. so when you say these links, they are ESA links? Yep. Yeah. Subclass relations. What do you do for part of, uh, in, no. because anatomy, you will have something is a part of something? Yes. So, SNOMED <laughs> for a very long time has had its own, due to the limitations of the description logics that they were using, they managed to recast part of relations as ESA relations. 
And yeah, I know that's a disgusting trick, but uh, that's what they had to do at, at that 10 years ago when they started, due to the limitations of description logics. So every, or most, I should say, most anatomical entities are represented with three different concepts for the same thing. Mm. So there's, uh, there would be appendix, uh, which means appendix or any of its parts. There's entire appendix that you use when you remove the entire thing. And there's, uh, there are parts of the appendix also. So, so they, represent, they represent a separate uh, concept here. Uh, they are represented as three, three different, different concepts. concepts yeah. And by but how are they related? The parts are related by, to by the... ESA relations. Oh. Because now you have appendix part as, uh, as a concept itself. Is a appendix. Is, so is a part of appendix structure, which means the appendix or any of its parts. Mm. So, yeah, uh, not, not the most, uh, not the easiest thing or the most intuitive thing for users. And they are actually reorganizing the, uh, they're, they're, they are changing this. So, so if I go to this ontology of uh, anatomy, yeah, the, the FMA, the foundational model of energy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they would, I think, they, they model parts, right? Yeah. Um, so I could find the most appropriate match and then use the specific things about part from that. So part. actually, what's happening is that uh, <coughs> SNOMAD has integrated pretty much the FMA. And in upcoming versions, uh, there will be parts, and the reasoning will, will support uh, part of reasoning as well. Okay, so it's an, it's an old problem. It's still not solved completely at this point in time, but within the next year, it's going uh, to be completely overhauled. So don't worry about that too much. Okay. Wait six months. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, but as part of challenges in, in SNOMED, there's a lot of legacy content, okay? The, the stuff's been developed over, do you have a question? No. no. The stuff's been developed over, uh, you know, 15 years, and, uh, and there's a lot of, not every concept has a logical definition, I mean, not every concept has necessary and sufficient conditions. Some concepts are primitive because that's, how they were born and they haven't been reworked. So there, there's a lot of uh, legacy stuff in there uh, that's, n of course, not amenable to the classifier because if you don't have necessarily sufficient conditions, there's only so much the classifier can do. Uh, it is maintained and edited by humans with help, you know, from description logic, but, uh, but there's still a number of errors that come from humans themselves. And quality assurance processes are difficult to put in place because of the sheer size of SNOMED in the first place. And so they, they and, and because of the legacy aspect. So they, they created quite recently ontology design patterns and they started to apply this um, quite strongly. But of course, the legacy stuff needs to be remodeled in some cases and there are still issues with it. So that, that's some of the of the issues that we have with stomach. So if we look at approaches to quality assurance, uh, you might be familiar with these kind of things. Uh, what comes to mind is that there are uh, methods based on the terms themselves, lexical methods. There are methods based on the structure, and I'm going to talk about these two, and there are met methods based on the semantics, but I'm not going to go there too much uh, today. Uh, so, about 10 years ago with my colleague uh, Ji Ku Jiang, we looked at uh, non-lattice fragments in SNOMED. And we know that uh, uh, lattice has been shown to be a good property for an ontology to have. Uh, it doesn't mean that if it's a lattice, everything is good necessarily, but we know that if it's not a lattice, uh, it's usually fishy and, and there might be reasons why it's not a lattice and, and uh, a reason why we should look at it from, from uh, this perspective. So a lattice 
he is a specific type of a directed cyclic graph uh, in which any two nodes uh, have a unique maximal common descendants and a unique maximal unique minimal common ancestors and and there should be one yeah there should be one in each case and it uh, a given graph is a non lattice when these properties uh, are not uh, are not found and in this particular case uh, what we can see is so we have the upper bounds at the top the lower bounds at the bottom and we can see that the two lower bounds actually share the same pair of concepts in the upper bounds uh, whereas if things were a lattice they should only share they should only have one in common and the reasoning behind this in terms of the, the ontological uh, property that uh, is behind this is that uh, if it's not the case, if it's a non lattice structure in this case, there's probably a missing, or there could be, for example, a missing concept in the middle here that uh, summarizes the common properties of these two concepts in the upper bound and that would be shared uh, by the two concepts in but the lower bound. But that could be a secret because the, the upper, uh, the concepts in the upper, uh, the upper level, they may be capturing very different perspective. Is it possible that there's a different aspects of the things that they are capturing? We're going to look at some of these examples and by and large what we found is that, okay, so so if we take, we did this 10 years ago, we take all of SNOMAD and we compute all the non-lattice fragments and we look at them. And we found, we found errors, but uh, it was not with a really high precision. In some cases, we could explain why it, it, was, uh, it was how it was. Uh, when we added the lexical properties to guide the analysis, we were able to find errors with, with uh, a much better accuracy, and that's that's going to be my point today. But we're going to look at, at examples. So in this case, it's heavily medical, but don't worry too much about this. Um, the so we're talking about two kinds, uh, uh, about several kinds of hypophysectomy. So a hypophysectomy is when you remove the pituitary gland, that's the gland that's at the basis of the skull. So you yank it out in some ways. And there are several ways of doing it. First of all, you can remove uh, just a part of it, or you can remove all of it. And there's a couple ways you can get to it. It's at the middle of the, you know, of the, the skull, it's that easy to, to get at. But one way you can go across the cranial bone, and that's what we would call a transcranial hypophysectomy. And in the low bounds, we find partial excision of the pituitary gland, so that's the partial hypophysectomy. By transfrontal approach, you go across the cranium, but from the frontal bone. And this one says partial excision of the pituitary gland by transphenoidal approach. You go across the sphenoid, which are the sinuses uh, in, in the nose. So two different ways, but it's also across the, across the bone in both cases. So in both cases, it's partial. And in both cases, it's across the bone. So one would argue here that if we had such a concept that that combines these two features. It's partial and it's across uh, the bone, across the cranium. Well, it would be an appropriate concept to have here. And if this concept were to exist and to be located here, the whole structure would become a lattice structure. And the world would be a better place, as, uh, as we argue. Uh, if we look at SNOMAD, we find many different uh, many different such cases. This is another one, so I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, it's about uh, uh, acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis or chronic obstructive bronchitis. So, and so you create these new nodes, I mean, 
are they virtual or do they actually have analog in the real procedure that they perform? Well, uh, in this particular case, it's, I mean, it's something that exists, but <coughs> if you instantiate it into, if you, if, if you ask the surgeon to perform this, it's going to say, well, I can go either through uh, the frontal bone or through the uh, spheroid. Which one do you want? Okay. So, but it's useful as an aggregation concept. It's an so abstraction, but it's it's some kind of an abstraction. Yeah, and that might be a reason why it wasn't in SNOMED in the first place. That's that's one can argue that it was the reason why it wasn't there in the first place. But anyway, th so this one is a little bit different. Uh, uh, same kind of non lattice structure, structurally the same, but uh, it's different when we look at the concept. So we have acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive bronchitis versus acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. So this one doesn't say obstructive. And when we look at the names, uh, well, this one has obstructive, this one has not. All the words are the same. and. The lexical semantics tells us that when you have an additional quantifier in one term, well, it usually means that this one term is a descendant or is more specific than uh, the, the term that has the same words except for this qualifier. In, in, so what this would argue here is that there's a missing ease relation between these two. In this particular case, you might have additional concept of what is an abstraction about or what is just about abstraction itself. I'm not sure I'm following uh, would, you here. Would you not want to basically incorporate an abstraction, abstraction itself as a concept uh, to further qualify? Well, it is, it is represented here because in this case, it is uh, also a child of chronic obstructive bronchitis. So the, 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 the notion of abstraction is represented somewhere. Then and it's okay. inherited at this level, if you wish. Yes? This kind of conceptualization, if we consider, for example, acute exacerbation of chronic bronchial and then obstructive as a property of that concept, do you think it's not uh, appropriate? Yes, well, that's that's pretty much what we're saying. I, mean, I, I, I don't know and I don't care in this particular case how this should be represented, but uh, we could assume yeah, we could logically assume that in a logical definition for these two things, uh, the, the obstructive notion should be represented as an additional property, if you wish. Yes, exactly, because, see, as soon as any kind of restriction that you are adding to a concept, if you want to consider as a sub-concept, mm -hmm. so you will end up with uh, actually messy <laughs> hierarchy. That might have, uh, because uh, uh, cannot uh, judge about this joint uh, behavior of this concept mm -hmm. and when they are obstructive and when they are not. But if they consider as a restriction, a, a kind of property over them, I think maybe. No, I think we're, I think we're saying the, we're saying the same thing. Except that in not every concept in SNOMED has the all the logical properties uh, represented, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is all a wrong example in this case, because when you talk to a doctor, they tell you that this doesn't exist. All, all forms of chronic bronchitis are actually That's obstructive true. in nature. And that uh, there's a, the problem here is not necessarily that this one he is a descendant of this one, but more that these ones, uh, there, there's not much of a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, but the point remains that there's something fishy, and uh, there's, there, there's two indications that there's something fishy. One indication is the non-lattice uh, feature, and the other, uh, the other indication is the set inclusion when we compare uh, sets of words for the lexical features, if you will, sets of words for these terms. And that's what we are doing. So if we consider that there was indeed a necessity of representing the obstructure, the abstractive nature here, uh, we, would, uh, we would create this hierarchical relation between the two and the whole 
uh, structural, uh, the whole structure would now become a lattice. Okay, so that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much what we have been doing, and in this particular aspect of quality assurance of SNOMED, we're combining the structural and the lexical features to to have higher precision. So we had done work on just the lexical features uh, in the past, and it works well, but it's not perfect, and there are false positives also. But these are a couple examples where it works well. Uh, I presented this last year at the International uh, Conference on Biomedical Ontology. And so it's not new. I mean, people have been doing this for a long time. The new aspect in this paper that I presented is that I did it with description logics, not based on the logical definitions from SNOMED, but based on logical definitions that I created from the terms themselves, like concept, has word, alveolar, has word, bone, has word, graph, has word, mandible, and this one has word, uh, alveolar, has word, bone, has word, graph, and when you run the classifier, it tells you which sets of words are included it's just cute. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not fancier than anything else. It doesn't do the job better than doing set inclusion, but it leverages tooling that exists, and the only cost is in creating these definitions, which is cheap, because you can do that completely automatically. Anyway, so these are a couple of good cases that we were able to, uh, to highlight and to extract. Just looking at... Uh, just looking at the lexical features. But now, in the work that I'm finally going to talk about today, um, we wanted to combine the lexical features and the structural aspects to uh, doing quality assurance in SNOMED CT. And, uh, but we also wanted to go one step further. So. Many of the groups that do quality assurance in ontologies, they just say, well, you know, you should look in that part of the ontology because we saw that there are more errors in that part than in that part. It's not really useful because at the end of the day, you still need to have somebody who goes through all this part and figures out where the errors are, if there are any errors at all, and where they are and fix them. So what we did in this one is that we tried to suggest Remediation. We try to say, well, there's this link missing here. Okay, it's not. Well, there might be something missing. There's this link that's missing, and we were able to do that with high precision because uh, we looked at specific patterns of uh, lexical features, if you wish, and that's what I'm going to present next. So when we want to do this, we need to do a couple of things. Uh, first thing we do is we need to, to identify all the non-lattice uh, subgraphs in SNOMED. And uh, so that's the structural aspect. The second thing is that we need to instantiate the lexical patterns within these subgraphs, these non-lattice subgraphs. We need to analyze what's going on. And of course, we need uh, to do an evaluation here. The first time we did, uh, we analyzed the non-lattice subgraphs. We did it uh, with, uh, uh, we decided to do it in Sparkle. So we created an RDF version of SNOMED. And we created Sparkle queries to identify the non-lattice structures. So we took all possible pairs of concepts within all each hierarchy of SNOMED, and we tested uh, whether the pair was within a lattice subgraph or a non-lattice subgraph. It took three months. We did 1.5 billion queries, and it took three months. Uh, now they've re-engineered the whole process, and the whole thing runs in a uh, Hadoop uh, environment. It only takes 30 hours to, to do the same thing. So that's uh, that's uh, really nice optimization. So, so when you analyze these pairs, it gives you all the uh, things that possibly are uh, candidates for uh, for subtyping. 
No, it just I no no no. It just identifies a the non-lattice fragment. It doesn't doesn't do anything else. Yes. Yeah, so then you go and check. And, uh, and now the we need to start adding the links. Is that what happens? And now we need to overlay the lexical features over that, and then we know where there is a problem. Okay. But the lexic the the structural is just a way of. Uh, telling us where we should look with the lexical. Is he doing what you showed in the previous slide? Mm -hmm. Is he doing what you showed in the previous slide? It's it's identifying these non-lattice fragments. It's not doing the lexical analysis at okay. all. Okay. Okay. The lexical analysis comes later. Yes. Two questions. At first, uh, there was. I mean, you were not able to do that with any reason or existing the relevant part. The lattice part? Yeah. No. So Evan, you couldn't implement any extension to reasoner to find such a lattice. Uh, I don't think it's possible. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. You know, the lattice, the lattice person is my uh, colleague GQ. He's okay. he's he's been studying lattices for thirty years. And now no, basically, in, in graph, you just want uh, one common denominator, right? I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and and you want to identify the cases where it doesn't happen. And uh, and I would be surprised that you could do that with a reasoner, but uh, because the Sparkle queries that we did were were not logical queries. It was more graph type queries than they were uh, logical queries. Yeah, but the Sparkle is quite a slow. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> three months. Yeah. yeah, and one more question is that I assume that you could do such a um, actually, um, such a search by a Sparkle in a kind of parallel manner. Yeah, because well. Because your graph is a kind of just. So uh, each long, absolutely. Graph. So each pair is independent, and we can. It was somewhat parallelized, but not not heavily parallelized. So it was not a good example of engineering, if you wish, what we did with Sparkle. Sparkle. And I'm not presenting this uh, as an example. I'm just saying that it was our early experiment with this, and uh, and uh, and it was somewhat painful, if you wish. But we did it. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay. So when we do this, or when they run their their analysis, their structural analysis, they find 630,000 non-lattice pairs, uh, and uh, in in 100. 70,000 non-lattice subgraphs. Of course, some of these subgraphs are small, like the ones that I displayed, but others are much larger. And we know that the large ones tend to include the small ones, so we don't really, we don't really care about the large ones. We focus on the small ones because they are easier to analyze and they, they capture a lot of the problems that we can find in the larger ones anyway. So let me play the devil's advocate. So, so maybe the reason why it was not uh, lattice structure is for notational efficacy, let's say. And that's the reason why they designed it the way they did earlier. So they didn't want to create extra... So that's, uh, one, re that's one reason. They, they wanted to be parsimonious and they right. didn't want to create every possible combination of right. everything that existed. Yeah, right. yeah, and that, that's a valid reason. But the cases that I'm going to show also show that uh, it's not the only reason. Parsimony is not the only reason. That uh, they, they are they are also mistakes. Okay, so the first lexical pattern that we looked at uh, is what we call containment, and it's exactly what I showed earlier. One uh, one set of lexical features is a proper subset of an ex another set of lexical features for the concepts within the non-lattice And it usually suggests a missing hierarchical relation, as we saw earlier, uh, between the two concepts, either in the upper bounds or in the uh, lower bounds, exactly as I showed with the obstructive uh, thing earlier. And we found 736 of these non-lattice subgraphs exhibiting this pattern. Here's another example. We have duodenal ulcer. So an ulcer in your stomach with perforation and obstruction, and chronic duodenal ulcer with uh, perforation and obstruction. So 
this one has chronic in addition to the other one for which we didn't know if it was acute or chronic. Uh, that's a containment pattern. And it suggests that there's a missing hierarchical correlation between the two. If we add it, the graph becomes a lattice. And so exactly similar to what we saw earlier. Not much to say about this. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, and if yes, does it suffice the uh, uh, requirement of, uh, does it suffice the uh, actually, um, uh, does it reason that it's, there should be a missing relationship in this structure for all the cases? Okay, so let me, let me go back a little bit. The first thing that we tried is to find all the non-lattice structures, and uh, there are 600,000 or something like this. If it's not practical to go to SNOMED and say, hey, here are 600,000 uh, structures that may contain some problem, why don't you have a look? Okay? It, it, it doesn't mean anything. And we know that some of them, for the reasons that uh, you mentioned, uh, they, they are not interested in fixing because they don't want to combine all possible properties all the time for parsimony reasons. So, the, in other words, uh, the precision of this method is not good. If we just do the lattices, the precision is not good enough as a quality assurance method. Now, we've also tried to do just the lexical. And we, when we do just the lexical, we have the same problems. In some cases, we find good things, but there are many false positives. So the idea here is, can we combine the structural properties and the lexical properties, and can we get better precision and better identification of the problems than if we just take one or the other? Okay, yeah. that's really the... the uh, that's really the motivation behind this work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I see two different things. So one is where you have orthogonal abstractions that you want to keep it independent. There I'm not entirely convinced that I want to force these mm -hmm. uh, lattice things, mm -hmm. except if theory demands uh, so. So on practical basis, I still want to keep them orthogonal and separate. While on the other hand, the missing links that you're showing is where if each link is supposed to be an ESA relationship, then this is not reflecting the real concepts and introducing them makes sense. And you're saying there's a lexical way of uh, obtaining them. Yeah, with greater precision. Yeah. Okay. And again, we are assuming there is no negation, there are no opposites and those kind of issues which will we, complicate matters. We, we get rid of this thing, I haven't, I haven't told you, but in the lexical process, when we have A without B, uh, we're not suggesting that it is is a B because yeah, it says without. So we, we take care of these negations. And, uh, uh, so we, here's another pattern now that we're using. It's an intersection pattern. So we intersect the sets of words. Uh, uh, and when the intersection in the lower bounds is equal to the set of words for one concept in the upper bound, uh, we can suggest that, again, there's a missing hierarchy correlation here. We're going to see an example. We find a thousand of these. So here we have uh, irritable bowel syndrome. That's the one at the top. And there's two variants of it at the bottom. Irritable bowel syndrome variant of, children, uh, uh, of childhood. Irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea. And what we argue here, and we can suggest it automatically, is that these two should be uh, direct descendants of irritable bowel syndrome, and itself should be a disorder of color. So that's, uh, that's what we suggest in this case. You automatic. So what is the basis of automatic suggestion? Excuse me? You said you suggested automatically. Yes, we suggest automatically that when we have this kind of a pattern, there's a missing hierarchical relation between the two concepts at the top. So, uh, but automatically, how would you decide which one is on the top or what? 
Which direction between the two? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we do it in this case. Uh, but, at least some additional information somewhere. but at least we boil it down. I, I'm, I don't think we do, we do it completely automatically. But at least what we say in this case is that there should be a link between these two. We don't necessarily give you the direction of the... Yeah, link. the human can give you the direction. Yeah, exactly. okay. but, but it still pinpoints the thing mm. to one particular place. Mm. So it, it's not completely automated, but mm. it provides remediation by pinpointing to uh, a specific place rather than saying there's something wrong here. Mm. Yeah, I'm not uh, entirely sure. I, I think you need to look at the labels. But, but topology, I can't. Uh, no, but topology, I can't say. For example, you can have <laughs> inorganic acid. That is what know. humans would do, right? That's what you mean, right? No, so I'm, there's nothing. The thing no, the fact that the fact that these two are derived from that doesn't imply that the two parents necessarily have to be in a class or class relationship. So suppose disorder of colon is completely orthogonal. Say you have inorganic, organic on one side, acid and base on the other side. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that case, I can't force. Uh, <laughs> If these are multiple inheritance of orthogonal yeah, abstraction, yeah, yeah. you can't force it. No, I think there are cases like this, but by and large, and that's why we did an evaluation of this. And by and large, the evaluation confirmed that the cases that we would find actually uh, were uh, positive cases. If you yeah. Yeah, you, you, you mean to say this cases. is more of a heuristic, it doesn't necessarily apply everywhere. Right, I mean, you may have to No, do. no, 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 it's, it's not going to apply everywhere. And, and, and uh, really, I mean, this concept uh, is used to come out organic and inorganic. So there's this, if there are orthogonal perspectives, yeah. that's not captured because this is a rather weak representation system. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, it's not the panacea and it's not going to cure all of the problems. But it's may nomad. point to where people should bring but in human Exactly, exactly. The way I see but we're confident that if we give this to a, human, to an, a, a snowman editor, they can do something useful with it, if you wish, without spending tons of time uh, going through all of SNOMED and, and poking around, if you wish. So it's, it's a way of targeting, pinpointing to possible issues. And uh, the precision that we have is sufficient such that we can Martin. confidently recommend it as a, as a method. So it's going to be more of the same for, for the other ones. So I'm going to go through this uh, uh, rather quickly. So union. Uh, let's let's look at the example. It's going to be uh, it's going to be easier in this case. So in this case, if we do the union of the words of the count of the terms in the upper bound, we have uh, uh, the set of words for one of the concepts in the lower bounds. And when it is the case, we suggest that uh, there is actually. A, uh, there's actually a missing relation between the two concepts in the lower bound. And in this case, I think we can safely indicate the direction because uh, the one that is the union should be the direct descendant of the two at the top. So the, the, so, the so remaining one should be at the bottom. So, so, so the union of the word is actually intersection of the sets? Uh, union the there. union of the words is the exact set because we have another one. Yeah, so basically one. it has to have both malignant uh, yeah, aspect yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 aspect. Yeah, yeah. So this one, what we're saying here is that this one exactly has uh, the union of the features of the two at the top and it should be uh, the other set. So the, um, um, the logical union should be and should contain uh, more restrictions and should no, I think no. In this no, case, no. No, the, the two things are there is properties from the top and individuals from the bottom. So it is intersection of the individuals and union of the properties. Exactly. So uh, in this case, it, it's like the um, uh, the, the hyperfectomy that we saw at the beginning, except that this one exists. The other one didn't exist, and we suggested to create it. This one that uh, that encompasses both it already exists. It's just not linked properly, if you wish. And there's another one that's a little bit more complex. Uh, but what I want to point you also to is that these more complex patterns yield a fewer uh, cases, actually. There are much fewer. It was in the thousands for the simple patterns, and it's in the hundreds or, or dozens, if you wish, for the, 
for these complex patterns. Here, we do the intersection of the concepts uh, in the upper bounds uh, and the union of the words in the lower bounds. Uh, and when something like this happens, uh, it suggests that uh, there might be a missing concept in the middle. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this one because I want to show you what we're doing these days, which uh, is a variant of this and uh, is, uh, is, I think, even more interesting because it goes a little bit uh, beyond this. So in terms of evaluation, we did a small evaluation. Uh, we, we took 59 subgraphs and uh, we had two experts review them. There might be one, more than one error per subgraph and we found actually 61 errors for the, uh, for the 59 subgraphs. Uh, not surprisingly, the uh, distribution of the patterns, uh, we had half, more than half for containment. Uh, one fourth pretty much for intersection and the rest was distributed between union and union intersections which are the more complex patterns and the remediation that was suggested by the system was accepted in 53 out of 59 uh, out of 61 cases which is a very good uh, precision if you wish and uh, there were actually deeper modeling issues that led to the rejection in the other cases. So again, the, the point here is that uh, we have enough precision in this case to, to confidently suggest that as a valid method for finding these kind of errors. Uh, so why is this significant? It is significant because uh, Unlike most other QA techniques for terminologies, we don't say, well, you know, there are more errors here than there. Uh, we actually pinpoint the errors and we suggest remediation, which is a big, a big advantage over other methods. Um, and, uh, and therefore we, uh, oh, it's also completely scalable. It's, it's all automated. Of course, there needs to be human review of these cases, ultimately by, by developers of SNOMED, with whom we've, we've shared this. But it is entirely scalable, which also makes a difference with you know, other, kinds of, uh, other kinds of QA methods that rely heavily on uh, the time of editors. So the main limitation here. Going back to what I said earlier, in a description logic system, the hierarchical relations are essentially the byproduct of the classifier. So humans don't create these hierarchical relations, they create the logical definitions, and the classifier places the concept at the right place in the hierarchy. Very good. So here, what we're saying is, oh, this concept is not at the right place, it should be here which is not really what's interesting for SNOMED in the first place. So what we're suggesting, when we say that we suggested remediation, we're actually not suggesting that SNOMED adds these things, these links, because they should be, uh, they should be computed automatically by the classifier. So what we mean is that we pinpoint uh, areas where uh, the logical definitions are actually deficient. So either it's because it's a primitive, uh, or it's because uh, uh, the, there's something missing or something wrong in the logical definition. And so the idea is that the SNOMAD, uh, the SNOMAD CT uh, people who create SNOMAD, they would actually have to fix the logical definition, rerun the classifier, and actually confirm that now that uh, the logical definition is fixed, it, uh, it goes at the right, the concept goes at the right place in the hierarchy where we predicted it should go. We only investigated four patterns. There could be more refined patterns and that's what I'm gonna uh, talk about a little bit in, uh, in the remaining uh, slides. So what we've been doing these days uh, lately, and we're, we're preparing a, a new manuscript about this. Uh, yeah, go before, ahead. Before going to the, the other board, 
I want to, I don't, maybe you are aware already of this work. Uh, there is a work uh, done by uh, Dr. Jens Lehmann. He is a professor at the University of Bonn. Uh, he worked for a couple of years on descriptive logic uh, learner. And this project is open source. What they are doing is that uh, they are learning uh, new concept out of the ontology by reinforcement uh, learning. Mm -hmm. So that m you might actually try that too also in this. If you have a reference, yeah, sure. I certainly would be interested. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good, uh, good suggestion. Thank you. So what we're doing, what we found in the previous analysis is that uh, uh, in some cases, we could get better results with the lexical, I mean, still lexical and structural together, but we, get, we could get better results with the lexical definitions if we enriched the lexical definitions with words from the ancestors and, uh, and with hypernyms. So that's the, that's the main uh, gist of all this. And I'm going to show you a little bit what we did about this. So the, to acquire the hypernyms, we do this. We notice that here we have fracture subluxation of a perilinate joint. It's joint in the wrist. And it's a kind of fracture dislocation of the same uh, joint. So what we can abstract from that is that since all the other words are the same, subluxation is a kind of dislocation. So we take note of this, we store it somewhere, and what we're going to do is that every time we see subluxation, we can enrich it with dislocation. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So in addition to doing this, we enrich the set of words for every concept with uh, words that are uh, that appear in the ancestors. So here uh, we have fracture subluxation of wrist, so we can have wrist added to uh, its descendants. That's what we do here, and we do it at each level. And so, of course, the concepts that benefit most from this are the concepts at the bottom, because they inherit from uh, more ancestors. So we do this uh, enrichment from the ancestors, and we add to that the hypernyms that we learned earlier. And so, in this case, we have fracture subluxation. Because we have subluxation, we can also add dislocation. And here we had uh, we had subluxation, but we already had this uh, dislocation that was inherited, so we don't have to add it here. It, we, it's only interesting to add it where it didn't appear before. Sublu subluxation is a type of dislocation? So we, we learned that earlier. We learned that from here because uh, in here we have fracture subluxation of uh, this joint, and it, a it is a type of fracture dislocation of the same joint. So we have to strike that subluxation yeah, is a but kind of dislocation. But there is no uh, other subtype for the fracture dislocation of the In this particular the subgraph. So you don't see all of SNOMED. You just see this non lattice subgraph, which mm -hmm. is all we care about. So you, you might find other kinds of dislocations in, in SNOMED. Mm -hmm. And there probably are. I cannot come up with one at this point, but uh, there probably are. So we enrich with. Uh, uh, words from the ancestors, we enrich further with these hypernyms that we learned earlier. And when we do that, when we do that, we find that we have at the top here fracture dislocation of lunate, and here we have fracture subluxation of lunate, enriched with, rich, with rest and with dislocation. And now this set becomes, uh, or oh, this set is a proper subset of that one which means that we suggest a possibly missing hierarchical relation in this particular case here, which happens to be true. And if this relation were to be added to the graph, the, the subgraph would become a lattice. So that's the spirit in which we've been uh, uh, working lately. Uh, this has worked uh, pretty well. 
we've done an evaluation of this, and again, we are in the high uh, 80s or low 90s in terms of precision, which, uh, which is really good, again, as a tool for combing through SNOMED automatically and, uh, and, and providing uh, areas where the SNOMED editors might actually find things to fix. Same issues as with earlier. I mean, we don't fix it. We don't fix the logical definitions. So the holy grail would be now to learn from this and see what's missing from the logical definitions such that we could suggest fixing the logical definitions. Uh, but we need to have stuff to do in the future, so that's left for, for future work. So uh, your accuracy, uh, the, uh, the accuracy that you are measuring is just um, uh, recognizing number of missing is a relation? No, 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 no. So when I'm, t when I'm talking of precision <laughs> in the 90s, what I'm saying is uh, when we review a number of them, and when we have two physicians or two um, subject matter experts look at, uh, what, at, at what we consider positive cases, uh, they agree with our, uh, they agree with the method in 90% of the cases. That's what I call precision. They agree with the, uh, these new... So they agree that these the links are missing, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's that's the point that I say that just the, to measure the missing is a relationship. Yes, but it, it's it's uh, not any other kind of uh, relationship in the ontology or, or. So again, what I'm saying is that these missing relations are not actually the point. Uh, they're not going to be added to SNOMED as such, and and SNOMED is fixed. Uh, SNOMED needs to fix the logical definitions uh, that are the root cause uh, why these relations are missing in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's still work to be done, and, and we're planning to work on can we find can we can we fix SNOMED completely rather than just suggesting that something is missing. But that's much harder because that's much harder. Okay. Um, but, so in summary, what we found, again, I want to emphasize that it's the combination of the structural properties and the lexical properties that has helped us uh, to be able to identify missing hierarchical relations with high precision. Because either of these methods can do it, we can, we're going to find tons of things, but not with high precision. And by combining them, we, we increase precision, and we're getting closer to doing something that's useful in practice for SNOMED. And in terms of generalization, as long as you have an, uh, some ontology that has uh, hierarchical relations, which most ontologies have, otherwise they don't deserve the name, uh, and uh, lexical features like terms, which also, I mean, in, in most ontologies, you, uh, you, you have at least a label. Uh, so th these would be applicable, would be amenable to this kind of uh, methods. And uh, with that, um, there's a few minutes left for questions. But thank you for being, being a, a great audience and having been an interactive audience. It was much better than just uh, keeping the, the questions for the end. But uh, any, any additional questions? <clears throat> that was a really nice talk for me as well. So uh, I have a question. Uh, can you like uh, pull down to a slide on duodenal cancer? On the renal cancer? Uh, duodenal. Oh, duodenal. Oh, the duodenal ulcer. Yeah, ulcer. The duodenal ulcer. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. Okay. So uh, my understanding from this was like the duodenal ulcer on the left side and the right is basically the right one is saying of, of talking about a more severe form of the left uh, entity or the left description. Yeah, well, technically it's not more severe, it's, it's just a different onset. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. uh, okay.
so generally what i so generally in like normal text or a healthcare domain people tend to uh, define severity by adding terms like chronic uh, acuteness so i was thinking of we are bridging the relation as kind of a severe form or a causal re uh, relation between this, these two terms mm -hmm. rather than defining an is is a relation kind of thing yeah. uh, I think, so I disagree with severity in the case of chronic because it's not because it's chronic that it's more severe, it's just, yeah. it's just you know, yeah. lingering more than, uh, than an acute form, that's, that's all it says. Yeah. Sometimes chronic diseases are more severe, but in this particular case, it's not necessarily the case. So mm -hmm. I think the point that you have is that, uh, the, the point that you're making is that instead of only saying that the chronic form is a kind of the other form. It would be much more interesting to say the same thing and say, oh, and by the way, the chronic form is chronic. Mm -hmm. And we want, to, we want to note, make a note of the fact that you record a property that is yeah. chronic. And actually, SNOMED has an onset property that can be, uh, that can be filled with chronic. So they have all the machinery to support this, if you wish. And that's probably what's missing from this concept. It probably just misses this onset property. And just adding the onset property, assuming that the concept is fully defined and it has necessary and sufficient condition, add, adding this and reclassifying would generate this uh, hierarchical relation. So we're not claiming that uh, you know, the goal is to generate it. We're claiming that it's missing. And it's missing probably because uh, uh, of what you mentioned, because this property hasn't been recorded properly. But again, the, the right fix is to record this property, uh, because if we do this, we will have a more specific definition for this one, and we will get the hierarchical uh, relation for free from the classifier. So I have a couple of questions. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, that was very interesting, uh, thank you. But uh, since we are also working on health domain, I'm looking uh, that what do, you, what do you see as an open research question for as an extension of this for, for future of SNOMED? This is the first question. And a couple of uh, our students working on information extraction from free text. And do you see any contribution from free text to evolving SNOMED? Okay, so, so two, two important and interesting questions. Uh, so the main issue that SNOMED is running into now, uh, one is quality, and uh, because, because it's a big thing and uh, it has grown organically over time, so it needs to be better. And, and, uh, and it's important that quality increases because SNOMED is used not only for clinical documentation to record what's going on, but it's also used for, as a substrate for clinical decision support. So if the information is not correct here, there's, there's gonna be uh, missing uh, recommendations that could be made by a clinical, a clinical decision support system. That's one, one aspect. When it comes to doing analytics, uh, so you have, I don't know, 10 years of EHR data recorded, coded to SNOMED and recorded uh, in your clinical data warehouse. Uh, if you want to do analytics, you're going to need to do aggregation or if you want to do any kind of, I don't know, machine learning or, uh, uh, or, or statistical analysis of the content, you're going to need to be able to do aggregation because you're going to have uh, maybe very few cases of this and that, but if you aggregate them together, you're going to have enough cases of this at the top to be able to have enough statistical power uh, for your analysis. So aggregation is really important. And you, the only way we can do aggregation, or the, the simplest way of doing aggregation, is by leveraging uh, these hierarchical relations. And people do that all the time, and it's true to the point that SNOMED distributes the transitive closure of ESA relations as part of their, of their files. 
because people need it and you know the doctor in uh, doctors in hospitals don't compute transitive closures not that it is difficult but they don't do that and snomed does it for them so so that's uh, quality is important for all these reasons and is still an open issue uh, the other aspect of the question has to do with text. Uh, so there's a lot of biomedical knowledge and clinical knowledge that's locked in clinical narratives. Discharge summaries, uh, radiology reports, re pathology reports, all these kind of things. And as much as we're trying to uh, entice doctors to code, their uh, disinformation with snowman in particular, but uh, also with other things, uh, it doesn't work that well. Which means that, uh, by and large, dis disinformation still lives in text and still needs to be unlocked with uh, natural language processing and text mining uh, techniques, if you wish. And um, and there are, so there are, of course, a number of tools that already exist, NLM develops MetaMap uh, to find UMLS concepts, uh, including SNOMED concepts, because SNOMED is in UMLS uh, in text. And uh, you mentioned another um, uh, name entity recognition tool earlier. Alchemy was this? Uh, no, no, Alchemy, that, that's a general purpose. That's not for biomedical. We are trying to develop one. Oh, that's okay, okay. Care. But there, there are many of these tools. There are many tools, yeah. Some, yeah. some in the uh, uh, public domain, some in... Uh, uh, there are companies, uh, Linguamedics, come to mind as one company that does a lot of biomedical NLP. Um, so it, it's still an open... It's still an open... Um, uh, field of research, if you wish, because there's no universal solution that extracts all the concepts that you need with uh, the the appropriate level of granularity for a use case. So some guys, you, sometimes you care about severity, other other times you don't, and uh, so you need to be able to abstract away from details when they're not needed, or aggregate when uh, when you want to uh, to accrue statistical power or things like this. So it's still it's still an open question, I would say. Yeah. Um, and what was the infrastructure for developing SNOMED? Did you use Pratica or any other? Uh, what's your question again? I mean, what was the Modeling tool for SNOMED. Tools. Mm -hmm. The tools, so they're using an EL++ classifier to, to build SNOMED, uh, which is called SnowRocket. But actually, if you get the OWL version, you can, you can convert the, the SNOMED files into OWL, and you can classify them with whatever. We use ELK, uh, which is an e, another EL++ uh, mm -hmm. reasoner. Uh, you can use you know, the, the, the full OWL to DL, Reverse fact or Hamlet. It just takes more time, and you don't need. Uh, it, it, since it's not really an expressive DL, you don't need all the bells and whistles of these more sophisticated uh, reasoners. You can use something uh, as simple as Snow Rocket or Elk. Uh, one possible opportunity is that. Uh, so, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm a co-founder of a company. Its name is EZDI. So. It has developed a very extensive um, ICD-10 um, knowledge graph, uh, and then it does uh, NLP on um, and machine learning on clinical text. Uh, but, you know, because they want to then suggest. Uh, one of the things it does is I recommend this, um, to the coders the uh, mm -hmm. ICD-10 codes, IC9 and 10 codes. Now, if I can. Um, you know, interconnect uh, SNOMED city with ICD-10, and there are, I'm sure, connections with some of the terms wherever they are. Um, there will be additional, and it does work very well. I mean, you know, it has to do for commercial customers, and it has to come out with very good. You know, so it really has to understand the clinical text very much, including the lab reports and other things. Um, so there may be, you know, the, the question is, we we'll have to just see how it will work where we have SNOMED CD, it uses some part of knowledge, but it's not meant for billing purpose. And I see 
9 and 10, which is supposed to capture, uh, you know, which captures things which, with old epic concept. Yeah. This, you know, concept of obstruction of neurum would be there in, in that yeah. also, because there's a yeah. procedure for that. So, I, I think uh, it's just more complicated with SNOMED because you have more granularity, you have more features, if you wish, that you need to pay attention to. You have more qualifiers in terms. The terms, the terms tend to be longer mm. than in ICD. Mm. And therefore, it just, it just makes the name entity recognition harder. Mm. And the likelihood, there, there's also another issue. I haven't talked about this at all. But uh, so SNOMAD CT is not an interface terminology. So there, there's reference terminologies and interface terminologies. In reference terminologies are the terminologies or ontologies that give you, you know, everything you need for aggregation, for analytics, uh, but they don't have the goal of collecting all possible surface forms that you're gonna find in real text, for example. That's the purpose, or you, they don't have the purpose of using necessarily the same words that the doctors would use. It's more like in the spirit of a control terminology, they will express something with a very specific and very uh, careful wording such that it's unambiguous. But it's not necessarily the same words that are used in uh, biomedical discourse in the first place. And there is some impedance matching that needs to be done when you go from uh, the actual realizations of these concepts in text and the, the terms that you have uh, in, in SNOMED. So people have developed companies, there are companies like uh, IMO, which is Intelligent Medical Object, that provide terminology, local terminology for hospitals, or that collect the local terminology in hospitals and link this terminology to the standards, if you wish. Which means that what the doctor sees is their local, the, the words that they are used to using, and maybe they use calcium for uh, not the element, but calcium for the calcium test that they, they're used to ordering uh, on patients. And that's good enough for them, and just somebody in the you know, in the back needs to know that when the doctor says calcium, it doesn't mean calcium the element. There's no ambiguity. It doesn't mean calcium the element. He means calcium the test. So all these kinds of things have to be taken into account, and uh, and that's what makes it so. One difficult. particular version of this was uh, the you know subject of uh, dissertation last year from a group, uh, and it is called Implicit Entity Identification. Mm -hmm. So the reference oncology would have termed edema, but the doctors would use the fluid retention and other you know, descriptive information for that rather than using the word edema. So being, a, uh, we found that uh, in a particular corpus that we analyzed, uh, something of the order of 30% where all, of all the entity mentioned were not the one you will find in the reference neurology or the one that, you know, uh, are, are accepted terminology, but more of an implicit uh, yeah. description thereof. So that's also reminiscent of uh, something that was called consumer health vocabularies. Mm. Either doctors don't talk to patients in the same way that they talk to other doctors, mm. and there are more informal ways, and more informal synonyms, if you wish. Yeah. But they are also more ambiguous more synonyms, ambiguous. because uh, now seizure is going to be a synonym for epilepsy, which it is not, technically speaking. So, uh, so another point with that is, uh, if you use something like the UMLS, so the UMLS is the Unified Medical Language System, it integrates something like 150 such terminologies, including all the ones that we've mentioned today, SNOMAD and ICD-10CM and, and 148 others, uh, including consumer health vocabularies. Because okay. they, yeah, so by by looking at all the terms that are associated with a given SNO, uh, with a given UMLS concept, for example, you can enter SNOMED, uh, you can enter UMLS from a SNOMED term, 
and look at all the other terms that have been linked by UMLS to this particular snowman term. And in some cases, you're going to find an ICD term, and in some cases, you're going to find terms uh, that are less formal and that have been created for patients. So that's one way of doing this. And there's also the fact that the UMLS has a rich, by, by integrated all these vocabularies, it has a rich a set of hierarchical relations, and that if uh, the SNOMAD concept happens to be a descendant of some ICD concept, you might find a hierarchical relation between the two that may come from yet another terminology somewhere that wouldn't have, you wouldn't have found otherwise. Yeah, so and we are, we are using it well as, uh, but you know, what else do we need to use is what we are going to have discussion. So yeah, of course. Pick your yeah. brain, and how do we uh, combine that with use of BKR and all that stuff, so. Okay, so. sounds good. They've been asking about the access to the VKR, but um, I forgot to tell you. But we, we're going to talk about this uh, this afternoon, I guess, mm -hmm. if you're interested. Any other questions? Well, in this case, thank you for being a great audience. Thank you.